This was the finest heavy bomber aircraft of the war, including the Americans. Johnny, what made you join the RAF? I just left school uh, about a year, that's right, at the uh, end of 39. Um, I was working as a trainee assistant park keeper at Basingstoke Park, which was the start of my ambition to be superintendent of a large London park. That was a start. But before long, I began to wonder why I ought, ought to be getting into the war. I had a, a hate for Hitler to start with. And uh, I thought, I ought to be getting there trying to give him a bloody nose or something, at least getting something out of the war. And so I volunteered for the Air Force. The Air Force because having seen television programs of the World War I trench warfare, the army didn't appeal at all. And I don't like the water, so the Navy was out. And so I volunteered for the Royal Air Force. And they recommended me for pilot training. And within a couple of years or so, I started on the aircrew training. And I ended up in America. And we had two systems out there. We had our own British flying training schools. And the rest were under the auspices of the American Army Air Corps. And of course, America was nowhere near getting into the war at that stage, nor did they feel they wanted to be. And I ended up with one of the Army Air Corps places. And I, a good posting, Arcadia in Florida, lovely. But I could not stand the Army Air Corps. Their petty discipline and their sloppy marching really got at my nose. However, the instructors were civilians and, and very pleasant people. I managed to solo, but my landings weren't quite what they should have been. And he said to me one day, I'm sorry, son, I don't think you're going to make it. Joined up with a group of, there are 10 of us then, washed out pilots from various areas of the Army Air Corps training. And we were posted up to Maxwell Field in Montgomery. And there, we weren't supposed to talk going into breakfast. So he sang Colonel Bogey instead. And that was much more better, much more fun. Uh, our senior member was a was flight sergeant air gunner who had been hoping to reach her, but hadn't made it. And on the last morning after breakfast, he said, let's show these so-and-sos how to march. So we fell in RAF style outside the uh, dining room, then marched back to our billet, 160 paces a minute, arms swinging forward and backwards waist high. And the looks we got when we went by, at least we felt we'd left our mark on Maxwell Field, so that was that. And that was back to Canada to wait for a ship to bring us home. So I passed the, the bombing leader's course and went to, to uh, 97 as a spare bomber. Until I got to the stage where I was told I was joining this crew with an American pilot. And my first reaction, oh my God, bloody Americans again. But then, when I met this flight lieutenant, Joe McCarthy, six foot three and the bread to go with the height, big in size, big in personality, but as we were to discover, equally big in pilot ability, to give us tremendous confidence, me particularly. Whenever we went off, I always thought Joe would bring me back. In retrospect, um, most of my uh, environmental factors were knocked out of me as, as a young child. That was it. I had one of those fathers. And uh, um, I, I'd lost my mother uh, t uh, t two weeks before my third birthday, and my father took over. I was the youngest of six. Good gracious. <laughs> and I suffered. The relationship between us was, was certainly more like a hatred than love oh. until I went away to school, and that was it.
Johnny, when did you realise the significance of the raid, the Dambusters raid? We were told from the beginning that we would not know what the target was until much later in the training. We were also told there had to be absolute security. We weren't to talk to anybody about the type of training that we were doing or anything about it. It was amazing how much experience of crews there was there. Many had finished their first tour, some were on their second. There are only a few who were not so nearly so uh, experienced. And then the most interesting thing about it was it was going to be low-level training and uh, a low-level operation eventually. Low level, the height prescribed was 100 feet, but there are very few times that 100 feet was stuck to. A little bit lower than that every now and again. What hadn't, uh, in the meantime, the special aircraft had arrived. Special because, yes, they were still Lancasters. They had no mid upper turret. The bomb doors were virtually sealed, and there's two odd legs standing down just behind the nose one on either side of the fuselage. And then the bomb arrived, like a glorified dustbin, back, big, and at least we got the idea of what those legs were for. That was obviously going to carry the bomb, according to the uh, operations room, and a, a squadron. We met Barnes Wallace for the first time altogether. Some of us had met him on all occasions. But he, through film, showed us how he'd developed the bouncing bomb and told us some details about the bomb. It weighed 9,000 pounds, of which 6,500 was explosive inside it, fused with two depth fuses to explode the explosion at a depth of 25 feet of water and one self-destruct fuse. It had to be rotated backwards at 500 revs a minute. It had to be dropped from exactly 60 feet at a ground speed of 200 knots. Those are the conditions which the dropping that rotating bomb had to be stuck to. That started conjecture about what the target would be. And Popular opinion was the German battleships, notably the Tirpitz. Because when you drop that rotating bomb, you're some 250 yards away from the target. Should give you time to get away before you came into their heavy artillery. And so on Sunday afternoon, all uh, 617 aircrew to the operations room, and we learned how wrong we were. Um, the only thing when we first went in, there was a model of the Moen Dam and a model of the Zorpa, but the one of the Ada hadn't been finished, so it wasn't there. And on the wall, a map which showed two routes in and one route out into the Rio Valley and into these three dams. We were told two routes are shown because as to be used to confuse the Germans that perhaps a larger raid was taking place than actually was. I think it was the highest fired briefing I ever attended. The AOC was there, station commander, wing commander Gibson was doing the briefing was there, Barnes Wallace was there, the senior uh, <coughs> engineering and armament officers of Shampton were there, the intelligence officer, and the dear old Metman. And so the meeting started. And Gibson explained how he would take off with two others, they would head for the moon. And after him, two other threes, two more threes, would take off and follow him to the moon. If the moon hadn't been breached, they would carry on the attack with that under Gibson's uh, orders. And when it was, they didn't go over to the, to the Ada. That was nine of the aircraft. Five, next five, oh, including us, were briefed for the Zorpa. And of course, Zorpa had to be different from the others. It didn't have any towers, so there was nothing to find sight on. 
and it was so placed in the hills that to make a head on attack was almost impossible. And so we were briefed that we had to fly down one side of the hills with this port out engine over the dam itself, fly along the dam and estimate to drop the bomb as near as you could to the centre of the dam. This is the nose here. Is this where yeah. your position was? That's right. That's it. The most comfortable position in the aircraft. You've got the two cushions, belly length, to lie down on, and the uh, uh, shoulder rest right in front of you. Good place to sleep if you had the chance. You didn't have the chance very often, though. Mm-hmm. And, of course, was the escape hatch underneath there, where... If you had the bailout, that was where you went, just like that. Where you yeah. just popped that out and just yeah. dropped out. Right. Yeah. Piling out the way, lifted up, and where you went. How did it feel when you got back, knowing that so many of your comrades weren't coming back? That was quite a shock, a devastating shock. 19 aircraft took off. Three returned for various reasons. Of the 16 that went on, only eight came back. Three aircrew out of those eight aircraft had managed to bail out and been taken prisoner. We had lost eight aircraft, 53 aircrew, and three had been taken prisoner. A terrible loss for one squadron, for one night's operation, and it was felt throughout the squadron. And the bars in the the messes were open. And whilst drinking was going on, I'm quite sure it wasn't uh, uh, on the success of the raid. It was merely in commiseration with those who wouldn't be coming back to us anymore. And that was felt very strongly by all the aircrew. Time has moved on so much. You've seen so much with your days in the RAF. What do you think to the modern RAF in, in all the times that you've been able to observe it now? What are your thought processes on the modern RAF? Recently, I've had the, the pleasure of meeting several senior RAF officers, more particularly, <laughs> oh yeah, so, ah, Sir Stephen Dalton, who was the Chief of Air Staff until he retired in the year last, year ago, last September. And he introduced me to one or two of the others. But I got the firm impression that the senior officers are more down with the squadrons, with the Air Force, seeing what's going on. In my day, if you saw an air officer, it was once a year for the AOC's inspection. If you got it right, that was fine. If you didn't, you got a bollock in and you did it all again. But um, I found that there was a much closer connection. The senior officer in those days, up in the Air Ministry, they gave the orders, and that's where they stayed and see those orders obeyed. But now they're getting more down together. And I think it's working very well. One at uh, Curtin Lindsay, which is just north of Scampton, there's a station there. <laughs> they have a joint mess officers, warrant officers, and the senior NCOs. But Curtin Lindsay is responsible for accommodation for Scampton, or most of the Scampton people that need service accommodation are up at Curtin Lindsay, and they use it for their official functions. The Red Arrows, of course, are at Scampton, and some of those are busy up at Curtin Lindsay. I've been there uh, two or three times, and I have to say they're far too generous in the bar in the evenings. It's two o'clock and three o'clock in the morning before you get to bed. But um, they seem to get on very well with this 
jointness. I think, I think the Air Force, and I understand it, it probably happened with the Army as well, I'm not sure, but there's a, a much um, higher interest in what's actually going on on the ground and so on. So, and that's why the, the um, senior officers now do spend so much more time on the, with the crews downstairs on the squadrons and find out exactly what they're doing. I am proud to have flown with the British Royal Air Force.